Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. What I want you to kind of concentrate on here this morning is the aspect of that word one, because there are seven of them in this passage of Scripture, and we're going to talk about each one of those uh, as it unfolds in front of us, because what we have here is Paul laying out for us a theological construct for us to look at, dive into, because he just got through talking about the unity of the church and preserving that unity in the spirit and the bond of peace. And so we're going to see how that kind of plays itself out here in this text as Paul is continuing this theme of unity and oneness. And so I want to concentrate on this idea of oneness that deals with our confession of these areas that, that are so vital to Scripture and really come into play in terms of our theological construct. And so if you'll bear with me, we'll work our way through uh, these seven principles here this morning, our confessions. And as we do so, I want you to realize that there is a, a, a right way of dealing with our confessions and a wrong way. And when it comes to confession, I'm not talking about you know, getting in front of somebody and you know, laying out all your dirty laundry and everything that you've done uh, bad in the past and all that, because some people do that. The Word tells us to confess our sins to one, and one unto another, and I'm not talking about that today. So I'm not going to hold court and everybody come to me and you know, tell me all their bad stuff and all. That's not the case. What we're talking about is the confession of a theological construct that we believe in. And the question is, what do you uh, know what a church believes? What do they hold on to? And you could say, well, don't they believe the Bible? Well, yeah, they could believe the Bible, but they could believe certain things about the Bible that are taken out of context and build a theological construct that's really non-biblical. And I want to share with you an instance of negative confession that ended in tragedy. And it comes from Larry Parker's story. Larry Parker, back in 1980, he and his wife were caught up in this word of faith movement that they just confess everything's going to be okay and don't take any action toward it or anything like that. And um, they just let it play out, however it's going to play out. Where well, Larry Parker and his wife wrote a book called We Let Our Son Die. And the tragedy of this whole thing is that Larry and his wife, after being influenced by the Word of Faith movement and uh, all of that, withheld insulin from their child. Wesley was his name. These insulin injections could have saved the kid, but they refused. They just prayed over it, said he was going to be healed in Jesus' name. Wesley continued to get worse, and predictably he fell into a diabetic coma. The Parkers, warned by their church, their church leaders, and their theological construct, was warned about the impropriety of negative confession in their lives from other people. Hold the line. Just con positively confess over this child that he's going to be okay. And slowly, 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 Wesley's life began to ebb away, even though they held in their hands the thing that would save his life. And he finally died. Even after Wesley's death, the Parkers, undaunted by their faith, conducted a resurrection service rather than a funeral service. For more than a year following their son's death, they refused to abandon the idea of revelation knowledge that they had received through their church and their pastor. In the end, they were tried, convicted of manslaughter, and child abuse because they neglected to give their son insulin, the very thing 
that would have saved his life. Now, how are we going to deal with this? As a family, as Christian people who are part of a church, how do you deal with that? How do you counsel somebody like that that says, oh, no, we're going to hold off on giving you any medication, and we're just going to see how God's going to play this out? My question is, isn't God the God of all knowledge? Isn't he the one who has given us medical technology? So when somebody like my daughter who has a, an appendix blow up in her body, I just say, oh, in Jesus' name, I'm going to let you be healed and not do anything. And the poison is cur- coursing through her system, and we know that the end is going to be death. I don't do anything? That is the dumbest thing under heaven. You take the kid to get its medical um, practice and get the medical attention that they need. Now, I'm not discounting faith on the other hand either because I'm a person of faith. I make my living on being being a person of faith. So how do I balance that out? There's got to be a middle ground, folks. But when you live out here on the extremes of either positive confession or negative confession, whatever it is, things are going to go south pretty quick. And when we address this passage here in dealing with confession, really what Paul is trying to lay the groundwork for us is what is the ideal of our confession and what does it mean to be biblical people as it's raised up in Scripture as we confess these things. And so when we deal with confession, you can either look at it one of two ways. One is that you are standing before an investigator or a court of law and you're confessing that you committed a crime or, or, or some sin. That's one way, and that's not the way we're looking at it today. Or the other way of confession is that you are laying out a statement of essential religious doctrine. And I want to look at the doctrine. Now, that word doctrine kind of throws people off and they want to run away from it. But simply what it doctrine really means is just teaching. What does this passage teach about baptism? What does this passage teach about God the Father? What does this passage teach about? And you just lay that out there. What is it teaching? Well, we're going to dig into it a little bit. We're going to look at seven confessions here this morning. We're going to look at these seven really quick. Because my whole lie is not to lay this out foundationally for you to just kind of like hang your hat on. Because I want you to do your work. I want you to do your Bible study. I want you to dig in. And so today, really my whole idea is to take the rock and throw it across the pond, let it skip, and deal with these areas. And hopefully you, the believer, will drill down into these areas more than what I've shared with you today so that you gain a greater understanding of these seven confessionals that we're going to look at. Now, this isn't an end-all, be-all here. This is simply just touching on some of the areas of theology that we deal with because there's a whole lot more out there. There's a whole body of theology out there that really needs to be discovered. And hopefully through your time in the Word that you are kind of being, um, getting an interest in the understanding of theology and really wanting to be a person of deep doctrine. Because how will you know that you're being taken advantage of if you don't know your word? You need to be people of the word. And so this morning we're going to become people of the word. Now there are seven ones in here. The word one shows up seven times. Also the word all shows up four times. And we always know that whenever something is repeated in scripture, it's absolutely essential For us to really pay attention and dig into it for a moment. So let's begin by this first confessional. Is that idea of the confession of the church. That is the body. The body life. Now the church has been called many things. It's been used. Metaphors have been used for the church in many things. It's been called uh, a body of sheep. That we're a sheep with sometimes without a shepherd. Jesus Christ is our great shepherd, and so we are followers of the great shepherd. But one of the things that Paul likes to do is compare the church to a human body. And as you know, the human body has some good qualities about it, and there's other parts of our body you would think, man, 
I don't want anybody seeing that part of my body. You know, the wart that's on my knee. You know, or the infected big toe on my right foot. I don't want anybody seeing that. Matter of fact, I'm so, man, I didn't need to see that, really. Put a sock on that thing, you know, that kind of deal. But the, the more prominent parts of our body, our hair, our face, you know, we, you know, billions of dollars are being spent in the United States of America alone to prop up our bodies, to make it look good, smell good, you know, comb the right hair, have this right kind of gel on your hair, all those kind of things so you can look good and presentable. There are parts of our body that we want to present to people out there, and there are other parts that we just are not presentable. We would call those the weaker of the body. And Paul using the human body in terms of the church parallels these two. And he shares in 1 Corinthians 12 these words about the body itself. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. So the, the, the precedent here laid down is that in the body of Christ, we can't say that you can't say to that other person over there, I don't need you. That would be like saying, hey, I want to just cut off my hand and throw it away. That's not the case. We need everybody in the body of Christ to do their work. The body of Christ functions that way like a human body functions that way. On the contrary, he says in verse 22, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are what? They're necessary. Why are they necessary? Because it helps us to be empathetic toward other people. It helps us to know where weakness is and where strength comes from and where help is and where we can encourage one another and prop one another up. That's why there's weaker parts of the body. The members of the body which deem less honorable are those we bestow more abundant honor and the less presentable members become more presentable, Paul says. What we need to do is elevate those that are without strength, that are weak. Speak into their lives. Encourage them. Disciple them. Grow them. Help them understand the errors of their way and their theology and bring them along to maturity. That's what God wants for the body is to be fully mature in Christ. What God has done is taken this great, grand, glorious thing that we call the human race. All different races, all different backgrounds, all different colors, all different stripes, all different types of stories, and has brought us together in the body of Christ and says, I'm going to fill you with my spirit. Now be my representatives. And every one of you matter. Every one of you matter. You, my friends, have a story that someone else needs to hear. You have an experience that you've gone through that someone else needs to hear. And it could be a great thing that God has done. He's expanded your faith. You've grown tremendously and somebody needs help in their faith and you're there to help them. But on the flip side of that coin, maybe you've gone through some tragedy. You've lost a loved one. You have been destroyed financially. Death has come knocking not once but multiple times at your doorstep. And you've gotten through with the power of God's grace and His Holy Spirit. You have a story that other people need to hear. And they can benefit from that story. So be the body. We are called to be one body. And when we begin to snip at each other and backbite and do all that other stuff, what we're doing is we're starting to tear away at the fabric of the unity of the body of Christ. And you know from the last sermon last week, if you were here, Paul said, do everything that you can. I beg of you, church, to do everything that you can to preserve that unity, is what Paul says. We are one body, the church. Let's be the church. Let's be the church. 
The second confession that Paul talks about here is the confession of one spirit. And I want you to notice on the overhead that I have an asterisk outside, out beside the word spirit there. And that's going to come into play here just a little bit down the road. But I want you to keep pay attention to that. You might even, in your notes, where you're taking notes, write this word spirit in there and put an asterisk there because it's going to come into play here in a moment. Now, what's interesting about God's spirit here is that whenever you're saved, whenever you humble yourself before the living God, realizing that you need a savior and you can't do this life journey alone anymore and you need somebody to pay for your sins and you come to faith in Christ, you confess him as Lord and Savior of your life, God places his spirit in you and begins the molding process to make you more like Christ. Every one of you who call yourselves Christians and have had that experience have the Holy Spirit living in you. Now, he may not be as prominent as he needs to be in terms of control, and direction, and bolstering your faith, but he is there. It's how much are you relinquishing control to the spirit in your life? That's the question. But as we move through here, and Paul is saying there is one spirit, there are not multiple spirits. There is one. When you go to a church, there are not multiple Holy Spirits running around. Here's what's interesting about theology. God himself, the almighty God, the same Holy Spirit lives in all of us. It isn't that, you know, Pastor Matt gets a little bit of the Holy Spirit and I get a little chunk of the Holy Spirit and that person over there gets a little chunk of the Holy Spirit. No, God is one. He's never divided. So here's what blows me away is that the same Holy Spirit that lives in me is the same Holy Spirit that lives in my wife as my sister in Christ. And you, the same Holy Spirit. And it's like, how in the world can that be? And it's like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have it all figured out. But God does, and he is greater beyond all that we can imagine or think. Remember that passage of scripture that we just talked about last week? That he is greater than all that we can imagine or think. And he is greater to be able to allow the Holy Spirit to live in all of us, the same Holy Spirit. But then you ask yourself, well, why is that person seems to be so really on fire and filled with the Spirit? And I look over that person, they look like they're sucking on green persimmons. What's the difference? It's about relinquishing control because you know what? Deep down, all of us are control freaks. We want to be in control. See, that's why some people don't come to faith in Christ. They want to be in control. But God says, no, you've got to relinquish that control and let me be Lord of your life. We all have one spirit. And Paul uses this idea of the indwelling Holy Spirit as a temple being built up to glorify God himself. In, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 2, he talks about this idea of temple and building. He says, do you not know that you are the temple of God? Now, again, a rhetorical question with a positive response. So a positive response is what? Yes, I do know that. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the, Holy, the Spirit of God dwells in you and your response positively is what? Yes, we know that. Verse 17, if any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that's what you are, Christian, saint. And I know that a lot of us don't, we don't want to use that word saint because I'm not very saintly this morning. And when I got up, I didn't talk too saintly to my wife this morning or my kids. Get in the car, we're going to church, and you're going to love it. <laughs> you ever done that, parents? Ah, uh, we have. I'm the pastor, get in the car, we're going to church. We might go out and eat afterwards, or we might not. We'll have air sandwiches, is what we're going to have. If you don't get yourself straightened up. That kind of, we're the temple of God. We're holy. 
we're to be in, ushered into the presence of God. What are you doing to prepare your heart to meet with the living God in worship and worship of his word? What are we doing out there, folks, that we realize that we're holy temples of the Lord? We're holy temples of the Lord. Paul says in Ephesians 2, this whole building's being fitted together. It's growing up into a temple of God. That's us, the church. And then individually within that building structure are you, an individual brick in that structure itself. Now, if you have a wall, it's got all these bricks in it, and you start taking out bricks out of the middle of the wall, that wall is going to get weak and it's finally going to fall down. You matter in the church. So don't ever think that your giftedness or your presence or you know, your thought process or your background or your story doesn't matter. Don't ever think that. That's from the pit of hell. You matter. You matter to one another and you matter to God. That's why he died for you. Remember that. That's why God died for you. You matter. You're worth redeeming. You are a temple of the living God who lives in you through his Holy Spirit. One spirit. Another confession that Paul brings out is this confession of our, the hope of our calling. You have one hope of your calling. Hope is a powerful, powerful thing. If you've ever been in one of those places that has been dark and you seem abandoned and you wonder, does my life really matter? Does anybody really care? Hope is a powerful thing. And it may be that you're at a dark place in your life and you need a little bit of the sunrise in your life. Just enough to know that there's something coming that's going to be different. Something new. Something God-filled. Something centered on Christ. That is the ray of suns that come up over the, the horizon and begin to shine into your life. That it is a new day and it is going to be well with you. Hang on to that hope. Now it may not fully express itself all at once. But we hang on to hope. That's why the Bible calls us to run the race that is set before us. Fixing our eyes on what? Jesus who is the author and perfecter of our faith. That's our hope. That's our calling. Our high calling is to glorify the Savior of our souls. The one who stepped into our world as the light of the world. To shine into our darkness. To lift you up from that which entrapped you. And to set the captive free. And all of us are held captive by sin. And Christ came to be the sin breaker. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, Remember that you were at times separate from Christ. You were separated from Christ. Excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. It's, you were strangers to the covenants and the promises. You had no hope and you had no God in this world. That, my friend, is a bad place to be. There is no God, the world says, and we just fell right into that in our sin. But God steps down into our world and calls us. He brings us to the Savior, and we respond in kind by believing, exercising faith given to us by Him, and he saves us. And then he sets us apart for our high calling. And there are three areas, quickly, that are our high calling. Number one, you're called, my friend, church to holiness. You are to be holy people. I didn't say perfect. I said holy. Now, what does it mean to be holy people? It means that you have a mentality that everywhere you go and what you embrace is that you are set apart for Christ. 
And then how does Christ play that out in your life, wherever you're at? In your exercise, in your workplace, in your marriage, in your parenting, in your grandparenting? What, how does Christ bring and bear into that in terms of his holiness? We're set apart to be different. That's what hagios means, to be set apart. Different. You're to be different from the world. Don't act like them. Don't talk like them. Don't, don't speak like them. Now, you're in the world, but not what? Of the world. Now, you're in it, but don't be of it. Be light in your world. That's what it means to be holy. It doesn't mean to be perfect because God knows you're not perfect. You're in a process becoming more and more and more like the person of Christ. And that's our second calling is that God is molding you into the image of Christ and it takes a while. You know those uh, ice sculpture guys that take like a block of ice and they get their little chisel tools or they get their little... Uh, weed whackers or chainsaws and they go to work on that you know working on all that thing or the stump the wood and all that and they just like start carving that thing do you know the author already has in their mind what that thing looks like already in their mind they don't just like you know like me I am not artistic I don't have a bone of artistic work in my life I get the chainsaw and I just cut it in half there you go firewood that's me that's what I had in mind, firewood, you know. But the, the, the guy that sculpts it, he takes that thing and just carves intricately. What he's, he's already got in his mind what it is. And so when we come to faith in Christ, God looks at you and says, I have got an image for you and your life. And I know what I'm going to do, and I'm going to give you my spirit, and I'm going to start working in you. And I'm going to mold you to look like my son. I'm going to make you look like him, the image of Christ. And you guys know Romans 8, 28, that verse, right? For God, you know, works all things together for what? Good, right? To those that love him and those who are called according to his purpose. That's Romans 8, 28. We love to quote that when we're in, you know, beside somebody's bedside in the hospital or they're struggling with death or whatever. Hey, you know, God's got a purpose. You know, don't do that. Don't quote that scripture. Just it, It'd be rather to be quiet than quote that one. I know it's scripture, but sometimes it comes across trite and really like you're out of touch with what they're dealing with. Because here's the thing. Those that are going to fulfill the purpose of God, they're going to have to suffer. And that suffering comes in the molding of the person into the image of Christ. Look at verse 29 of our text in Romans 8. For those whom God foreknew, he predestined to become conformed, sumorpho, that is conformed with, that's the Greek word there, is that you and Christ, and we're putting this together, and you're both going to look like the same. And guess what? Guess who has the greater work to look like Christ, Christ himself or you? And I look at myself in the mirror and I say, God, you've got a lot of work to do you got a lot of work to do in this guy. Because I know I'm not perfect. And really, if you want to know my shortfallings and all, all that, go ask my wife, but please don't. <laughs> we all have problems, and we all have issues to become like Christ. Some are areas that are, are easier, and some areas that we, we can't let the bitterness go because somebody hurt me in the past, and I'm unforgiving in that area. Sometimes it's, um, you know, somebody abused me when I was a kid, and I can't let that go. Because by golly, they need, they need to feel that pain. And they're, I mean, they're long gone, and they're dead. And here I am holding on to this bitterness. You know what, that dadgum co-worker messed me over. And you hold bitterness towards somebody in your employment. I mean, the stories are replete out there that could affect us in this way. Please don't let that be this case. Let Christ mold you into his image. Let him be uh, conforming to you. That's what we're called to be holy, conform to the image of Christ. And another area that we're called to is that, folks, yes, you're going to suffer in this life. 
Now, when we hear the word suffer, we think, well, maybe somebody's going to hack my arm off or whatever, you know. And that might be the case. But you know what? Suffering isn't always physical. It could be financial, that somebody sees you, knows that you're a Christian, you're kind of, you know, out there on the edge in terms of who you are, and you're, it's, it's just, you're, you're a Christian, they know it, everybody else knows it, and you get passed over for a promotion. They don't want you, Jesus freak, in their business. So they pass you over, and then you still remain where you're at. And you see, you know, you're qualified, but you see all these other people who, in your mind, are not qualified getting, getting by you, and you're thinking, what? What, am I like chopped liver here? What a, did I not like put my deodorant on this morning? What's up? It could be your faith. Because everything that you stand for and believe in runs contrary to the world system that you live in. This is not our world. Don't settle down. Be the men and women of God that you're called to be regardless. But you will suffer in this life. And I know that there are people and churches and religious leaders that tell you otherwise. Do not believe them. Do not believe them. Because God's word tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? So what is what Peter is saying? You should be getting your backside beat for sinning. Then he turns the corner using the conjunction, but but if we go this way, another direction, when you do right and then you suffer, man, that rubs against the grain. And you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. That word favor there is the word charis. It's the same word that we use for grace. It is God's gift to you and your gift to God as you suffer patiently through that ill treatment in this life. You know, parents, you've used this one on your kid. They come up to you and some decision's been made and they throw it back in your face and they say, it's not what? Fair, Fair right? And then you come back with, you know, life's not fair. So get over it. Get over yourself. Life's not fair. Okay? You're going to find trouble in this life. But Jesus said, take heart. I have what? Overcome this world. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy set before him, despising the shame, and sit down at the right hand of God victoriously. We serve a victorious Messiah. Trust him. Trust him. Fourth confessional is that we need to confess Jesus as Lord. Here again now is the asterisk that we need to put there by the Lord, by the Lord's name, Kurios. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 is the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is what? One. We don't serve multiple gods. There is not a pantheon of gods that we serve like the Greeks or the Romans. We do not serve multiple gods. We serve one God who expresses himself in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, we do not preach ourselves, but we preach Jesus Christ as what? Lord, kurios, and we as your what? What does that say up there? Bond servant. That word is slave. Doulos. Kurios and doulos. That's the connection there. You can't have a kurios without followers who are called doulos. And you can't be a doulos without a Lord called kurios. Those two are in sync relationship with one another. We don't like that word slave because it has a lot of baggage in our culture because of the slave trade from Africa. But even before slaves from Africa, they had slaves in the Roman world. And there were really, 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 really good slave owners, and there were some really, 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 really bad ones. And what Paul is saying here is that Kurios, our Lord, Jesus Christ, 
is one of those really, 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 really good slave owners. Because he has your best interest in mind. Yes, really. He really has your best interest in mind. And the reason being is that he died for you. Peter, one of the greatest sermons that he's preached in the book of Acts comes from Acts chapter 4. He's been arrested by religious leaders, been put on kind of a kangaroo trial, realizing they can't hold him, so he and John are kicked loose. And he turns and he starts talking to his contemporaries about Jesus Christ. And he makes this statement in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there's salvation in no one else. You will not find salvation in anyone else or any other place on this earth. There is no other name under heaven by which man will be saved. And you're here today, and if you're not saved, and you don't know Christ in a personal way, you will find salvation in none other than Jesus Christ himself. So get on that journey and find out who he is. Ask questions. Get curious and find out who Jesus Christ is because he is the one that has the power, the will, and the way to save you from your sins. The fifth thing that Paul talks about here is the confession of our faith. And this isn't that your faith, that's what you believe in. This is a body of knowledge that springs forth from Scripture that we've understood and looked at and whatnot. How do you know what we believe as First Baptist Church? How do you know that? Where do you go? It's in the Bible. It's also in a faith statement that we've put together. It's in our new members class. It's up on our website. You want to know what we believe? Go up on our website, look under what we believe, and poof, there it is. And it lays it out there very cogently for what we lift up from Scripture and says, this is what we believe. And when it comes to our faith, we're talking about that body of knowledge of why you're here, of why and what has attracted you to be part here and understand the faith journey that we're all on together. Jude, in Jude chapter 1, verse 3, actually there's only one chapter in Jude, so it's really just called Jude 3. He says this, Beloved, while I was writing to you, I wanted to talk to you about my hour of common salvation. But then he got prompted by the Holy Spirit to write something else. And he says, I want to write to you about our faith. And here's what I want you to do with your faith. Notice he says, I'm appealing to you that you do what? Contend earnestly. Now, what kind of picture does that paint for you? Contend earnestly. Fight for it. This Greek word here, epi aga, um, agonizomo, is, or agonizomai, comes from the word epi for and then agonize over it. That's what this word is. He wants you to, to wrestle with it, fight with it, contend for it, because the purity of the faith keeps you propped up and it also brings people into the faith journey with you. Struggle over it, contend for it, fight. For this faith. It's not just something that just flops in your lap and you can take it or leave it. No, that's not the faith. That's not the faith. Another confession, the sixth confession out of our seven, is that of baptism. How many of you have been baptized? How many of you have you not been baptized? Raise your hand. Be honest. Raise them up there. Come on. Not been baptized. Very good. All right. Now, so let's talk to you guys that haven't been baptized. What is the purpose of all of these folks out there who've gotten baptized and then you haven't? What does that mean? Are they freaks and I'm not? What does it mean to be baptized? There you go. We're up here in the, in the baptistry. Okay, people walking through there. It doesn't, it's not about the water. It's not about those swag-looking uh, white robes we give you back there. Yeah, <laughs> Janet's going, yeah, like, right, yeah. We need to take up an offering and bring, get some new robes, don't we? It's not about the towels. It's not about the heated jacuzzi water up there or any of that stuff. There's something about baptism that is meaningful theologically that draws us to this confession of it. What does that mean? It's an identification outward to the world around you that you follow something very, very important. And Paul wrote about this in Romans chapter 6, and he says these words, words here. Back it up. There we go. 
Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. There is a picture up here. And if you've been here while we've done baptisms, you realize that when we take the person and I smother their nose and mouth and hold them and dunk them underwater, and if you're a dad with kids, I'll hold them on a little longer if you want me to. We dunk them underwater and bring them back up. That is a picture of being laid down into the grave and then being brought back up in newness of life to walk with Christ. It is a beautiful picture of death and resurrection. And if we've been baptized into his death so that as Christ was raised from the dead, so we too might walk how? What does it say? In newness of life. See, this is a newness, a direction. So your baptism here is about the sealing of of God's salvation in your life and you're telling everybody else outwardly, I am a public follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I identify with him. That's my Savior. That's my Lord. I'm his doulos. I follow him. That's what you're saying in your baptism. And, folks, the church is commanded in Scripture to baptize people. Matthew chapter 28. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go preach, teach, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinitarian language of baptism. That's what we're called to do. It is about being obedient to the Father when he calls us to baptism. And I'm going to go there. I'm going to go there. If you haven't been baptized, you're being disobedient to the Lord God. I'm just going to throw that out there. We'll be having baptisms next week. (laughs) Or two. The final and seventh thing that we're going to look at here is the confession of God and Father. Now notice there's blue statements here. The Spirit, the Lord, and God the Father. What Paul has done in a very cogent, short way in three verses is brought out Trinitarian language here. He doesn't say that God is Trinity. He just expresses that in the way that he's done the Lord, the Spirit, and God the Father. And we recognize God as Father because God is God. There are no other gods. Matter of fact, it's replete throughout the book of Isaiah, 45, 46, 47, and 48. All those chapters that God says, I am the only God and there is no other. I know no of another. I am the only Savior. I have been from the beginning and I will be in the end. I mean, great, great verses there to look at. And God says here, in terms of restoring Israel's glory and its blessing, he says, the products of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush and the Sabians, men of stature, will come over to you, Israel, and they will be yours. They will walk behind you. They will come over in chains and will bow down to you. They will make supplication to you, saying the following, surely God is with you and there is none else. There is no other God. We followed all these other gods and realized that that was, that was whack. And we realized that you have the only true God. He is the only God. And then God goes on and says in Isaiah 46, 9, Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. You can take it to the bank that this God that you worship is the real deal. And if you're here today and you don't know him, you don't know his Savior and the offer of salvation, I call you to come to God today and know this God. There is none other like him. And he can bring hope into your world. Come to him. He's calling to you. Well, let me give you three application questions that we can take away from this and um, study on this as we go back through this verse. Of the seven confessions this morning that we looked at, what one or two do you personally need to work on? You're not perfect. You have areas of growth. We all have areas of growth. What one of these or two of these seven do you really need to kind of work on in your own life to be more like the image of Christ? Secondly, are you fulfilling your calling when it comes to holiness, that is being a set-apart Christian, 
not acting like the world, not looking like the world, and or submitting to the image of Christ, what God is wanting to build into you. See, folks, we can resist that because we can build in our own life the image of the world. And you've got competing worldviews. You can look and act and speak like the world or you can act like Christ. You choose. God's chosen you, so I would choose the latter. Choose Christ. And then finally, have you personally confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, kurios, of your life? And if you have not, why not? What's keeping you back? What's holding you? Something that the world's offering you? What's holding you back? And then I'm going to ask you the same question. Have you been baptized in the name of Christ? And if not, why not? What's holding you back? What's holding you back? And remember our action points of being the church. Connect, serve, invite, and give. May the Lord take this message, use it in a way that molds you more and more into the image of Christ. Thank you.